I'm Joel Klatt, and here are my five best defensive players in college football this season. At number five, it's TJ Edwards, the linebacker from Wisconsin. Now, Edwards didn't have the tackle production that maybe some other players did, but that's because it was really tackle by committee. He still had over 80 tackles, he had four interceptions, and he was a force to be reckoned with, a quality leader. And in Jim Leonard's defense up there at Wisconsin, this guy's gonna have the production to get right back to where he was a year ago, which was a finalist for the Buckus Award. At number four, it's Devin White from LSU. This linebacker has some serious skills and some speed. As far as the players returning to college football, I don't know if there was a better sideline to sideline linebacker than Devin White, who had 133 tackles for the Tigers. He was the SEC Defensive Player of the Week four times. He's the first LSU Tiger to do that in their history. At number three, the Outland Trophy winner, Ed Oliver. This guy is a top five draft pick. He's all energy all the time. He can rush the quarterback from the interior. I don't know if there's been as dominant a player for his league since maybe Indomitian Sue at Nebraska or maybe Warren Sapp at that same position uh, back in his Miami days. At number two, the leader of maybe the best unit in all of college football, which is Clemson's defensive line, and I'm gonna go with Cleland Farrell. Cleland Farrell is 6'5", he's 265 pounds, he's fast, he's powerful, he can get to the quarterback, and for the most part, he's single blocked. Why? Because he's got four other guys, three other guys that are all first round draft picks that he's playing alongside. And my best player, most dominant player in all of college football is Nick Bosa, the defensive end from Ohio State. I think this guy has a legitimate chance to actually be in the Heisman Trophy race because his team is going to be right there. His quarterback is going to be young and probably won't get the love that people should give Dwayne Haskins. And I think his production is going to be monstrous. Why do I say that? Well, Nick Bosa last year played really 50, 60% of the snaps because of how many great defensive ends they had at Ohio State. They could rotate them. So Bosa wasn't in on every play. You take him from 28 snaps per game to 55, 60 snaps per game, his production is gonna go through the roof. You cannot block Nick Bosa. He's too powerful, he's too fast, he's too flexible, he's better around the edge. This dude is a one-man wrecking crew and he's my most dominant defensive player in all of college football. Hey, Joel Klatt here, college football on Fox, lead analyst, and I'm going to rank the Power Five conferences. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, right? Maybe you don't. Let's go five to one. We're going to go with number five, it's the Pac-12. Pretty easy to put the Pac-12 fifth right now, even though they're the most parody-driven conference that we've got in college football. You can make an argument that this season we may have five, six teams from the Pac-12 ranked in the top 25, but that's not going to raise them up my rankings. Why? You finished one and seven in the bowl season last year, one and seven. So even if you take the six and two that they were before that against power five opponents in the non-conference, one and seven. Pac-12, you got to do better than that. By the way, Washington, if you don't beat Auburn, People might write off the conference for the entire season, so you cannot overstate the importance of the Huskies going down to Atlanta and playing the Auburn Tigers in week one. At number four, I'm gonna go with the ACC. It's really easy, and people, I think, out of laziness, put the ACC higher, but when you actually dig into the numbers and you look at the ACC, they're incredibly top-heavy. Clemson's an elite program. I mean, they're one of the two, three best programs we have in our sport right now. And Dabo Sweeney should get a lot of credit for what he's been able to do there with the Clemson Tigers. But when you look past Clemson, there's a lot of average programs, in particular with FSU falling off last year and Miami not quite finishing off the season like they could have in Mark Rick's second season. Now, those two programs clearly need to get back into that top 10 caliber. And if they do, maybe the ACC will rise up these rankings. But for now, the ACC's numbers and the sheer lack of depth in their conference are gonna keep them at number four. At number three, I'm gonna go with the Big 12. A lot of people will put them at number four. I know they have just 10 teams. They haven't won a national title in quite some time. Oklahoma didn't beat Georgia. It's easy, right? It's easy to put them at number four, but they're not. They're very good at the top end of their conference, and in the middle of their conference, they're even better than you would expect, and the numbers bear that out. Keep in mind that everyone wants to lament the fact that the Big 12 does not play defense. Well, maybe it's just good offense. If you go to their non-conference games against Power 5 opponents last year, they scored 32 points a game. 
They were 8-8 eight and eight in those games, by the way. They're the only conference that was 500 or above along with the Big Ten. So the numbers suggest that the Big 12 is actually much better than people give them credit for. You could have five teams in the top 25, and you have four legitimate league title contenders with OU, TCU, Texas, and West Virginia. And oh yeah, Will Greer might be the second straight quarterback out of the Big 12 that wins the Heisman Trophy. So the Big 12 is going to sit at three for me. At number two, and direct your hate to at Joel Klatt on Twitter, because it's you, SEC, and I know that it just matters more, but the numbers bear out that your conference is not the best in America. Now, let me preface this by saying you have the best program in America. By, right now, a wide margin. Nick Saban and Alabama are elite as elite as elite as they come. They're the best program I've seen maybe ever in my life covering college football. Georgia is on their way to that point. So you got two very good elite programs in the top two or three in all of the sport. The problem comes after those elite programs because the rest of the conference is not quite up to par. It's easy to argue that the SEC is incredibly top heavy and the numbers bear that out. If you just take Alabama and Georgia and you take them out of the equation, those are the elite programs. What's the rest of your conference doing against power five opponents in the non-conference? Well, they were only six and 12 in those games. Six and 12, that's not very good. So the middle and bottom of the SEC is just average at best. Plus they only get eight league games, they play four cupcakes. So even if you're going to a bowl game, you're still not a very good conference. With eight league games, you would think that you would play a lot of power five opponents in those four opportunities that each team has to play those games. But in the 56 possible non-league games, you got me now, four games, 14 teams, 56 opportunities. Only 13 of those games are gonna be played against power five opponents. That's 23%. So your league already only plays eight league games and your league only plays 13 of 56 non-league games against Power 5 opponents, the lowest percentage of anybody in America, you gotta do better. And at number one, it's the Big 10. This Big 10 conference this year is as strong at the top as I've seen in quite some time. Just take into consideration that if Wisconsin, Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, and Ohio State all start in the top 10 or maybe even top 15 in the country, that would be the equivalent of Washington, Oklahoma, Clemson, Georgia, and Notre Dame all being in one conference. We'd be going bonkers right now. That's exactly what's going on in the Big Ten. Four of those teams are in one division. The East Division in the Big Ten is the toughest division in all of football, and there's really no argument about it. You've got four teams that are all top 10 caliber. You've got great coaches, very good recruiters, and elite level programs. When you chart out the actual numbers of what this conference did against other Power Five conferences last year, they were the only conference above 500, and they were above 500 by a wide margin. They were 14 and six against other Power Five leagues in the non-conference. That's an incredible mark, an incredible mark. You've got mid-tier teams in the Big Ten winning 10 games like Northwestern did a year ago. Wisconsin's gonna be in the playoff hunt. Ohio State's gonna be in the playoff hunt. Michigan might win the East and Jim Harbaugh might go to the playoff. This conference is as good as any in America and I would argue they're better. And that's why they're number one in my rankings. Hey, I'm Joel Klatt, and these are my top five quarterbacks heading into 2018 in college football. At number five, I'm going to go with UCF's McKenzie Milton. So McKenzie Milton last year, when Baker Mayfield was still playing, was second in the country in passer efficiency rating. And when you look at this statistic, this was the best combination of passing and running of anybody, even Lamar Jackson. He threw for 4,000 yards and ran for 600 yards. You know, he's the only quarterback in the country that threw for over 4,000 and ran for over 500. At number four, I'm going to go with Khalil Tate at Arizona. I mean, shoot, we all know what he did last year rushing the football. When Brandon Dawkins goes down against Colorado, this game's on the road in Folsom. He goes down in the first series. What does Khalil Tate do? He comes in and runs for an FBS quarterback record 320 plus yards on the buffs. I mean, a little embarrassing as a former buff, but I mean, tip of the cap to Khalil Tate. At number three, I've got Trace McSorley at Penn State. His X factor is just the X factor. Guy's 14 and 0 at home. He's thrown a touchdown pass in 28 consecutive games. Guy gets it done and his leadership this year for Penn State is gonna have to be second to none. 
He's going to have to play great, but something tells me that he will. And number two on my list is going to be Will Greer, the quarterback for West Virginia. And the reason he comes in on my list is I think there's a really good chance that Will Greer leads the country in passing this year. He's got an offense to do it. He's also, like Rudolph had last year for Oklahoma State, has a really deep and quality receiver core. He's got David Sills back, he's got Gary Jennings back, and he's got a schedule at least early in the season that he can put up a lot of yards against. And for me, my number one quarterback this year, it's gonna be a little bit of a carryover to the NFL draft because I think Justin Herbert is the best NFL prospect in college football, and so he comes in at number one. Last year in the games that he played, remember he broke his collarbone, so when he was on the field, Oregon averaged 52 points per game. When he was not on the field, they averaged 15. So his importance to that team cannot be overstated. He's big, 6'5", 6'6", big arm, accurate, good decision maker. They're gonna have a quality defense and you could be hearing a lot from Oregon and Justin Herbert as this season moves along. Justin Herbert is my number one quarterback. Hey, I'm Joel Klatt and here are my top five running backs going into 2018. At number five is Wisconsin's sensational sophomore, Jonathan Taylor. Now Taylor burst on the scene last year as a true freshman and he averaged over 140 yards per game, which was good for third in the country. Why do I love him this year? He's running behind essentially the same offensive line that he did last year. And he's got a veteran quarterback with a good core of wide receivers around him. I think Jonathan Taylor could lead the country in terms of yards per game. Right now, Jonathan Taylor, number five on my list. At number four is J.K. Dobbins, another sophomore out of the Big Ten. Now, what I love about J.K. Dobbins is that, yes, he's clearly electric and he does some great things on the field. And when they give him a chance to be the featured back, he produced and he produced in a big way at Ohio State. But it's even more than that. There's going to be a small change in the style that Ohio State has to use for their offense. And it really has to begin with their quarterback, Dwayne Haskins. He's not the runner that J.T. Barrett was. So all those critical run plays that Barrett was asked to get the first down, third and short, big moments, those carries are now gonna go to J.K. Dobbins. It could be a big year for J.K. Dobbins at Ohio State, which is why he comes in at number four for me. At number three, it's Rodney Anderson for Oklahoma. And I know he doesn't have Baker Mayfield, uh, but he does have Kyler Murray. Between Murray, Trey Sermon, and Rodney Anderson, everyone's gonna get their production and Rodney Anderson proved last year, in particular in the last eight games, that he could be a bell cow. He rushed for over a thousand yards just in those eight games. That's incredible production. He's one of the best running backs in the country. He comes in at number three for me. At number two, the All-American, the man who had 32 rushing touchdowns last year to lead the country by nine. His name is Devin Singletary from FAU. That's right, the Lane Train, Lane Kiffin, giving the ball to Devin Singletary last year 301 times. That was the most in FBS. Incredible production. I love Singletary. He's a big back that is fast, mobile. He catches the ball well. He's my number two back in the country. And at number one, this is no surprise. It's Bryce Love. Bryce Love had 11 consecutive games with a rush of over 50 yards. 11 consecutive games. That's insane. His production is through the roof. He had 25 carries of 30 or more yards. Only two other teams in college football had more than that. Teams, not players, teams. If Bryce Love stays healthy, there's a great chance he wins the Heisman Trophy, that he leads the nation in rushing, and that he leads Stanford to potentially a Pac-12 North title. Bryce Love is my number one running back in college football.